monarch right there, feeding from a flower. Oh, laying eggs. You got her laying eggs right there. Oh, yes. Laying it on the swamp milkweed. Yep. Egg laying on the swamp milkweed. I know I don't show swamp milkweed too much in the videos, but, uh, well, here we are. <laughs> All right, cool. Hi, I'm Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out the monarchs. I thought we'd take some time today to delve a bit more into what is perhaps the most spectacular phenomenon of this animal that we so well endear, the fall migrations. Now, we're not there yet this season. Today, the filming, this is July 16th. The flowers are still in full bloom. Swamp milkweed's kicking here at 40th Street Pond in Port Huron. The monarchs are flapping around, laying some eggs. The monarchs that are laying the eggs right now, though, well, these eggs, they're going to hatch and become a generation that, as long as they're around two weeks from now, they'll be laying the eggs for the migratory generation. I wanted to take some time to make an episode that really delves deeper into what the migration is and lets you maybe see it a little bit more through my eyes. To be able to see the beauty that it has, the mysteries it involves, and the fragility that this migration, really the migrations, hold. Before we get into it though, let's do a quick overview, make sure we're all on the same page. The migratory journey, we could say, begins in the winter. With the monarchs at their overwintering sites, those that are east of the Rockies, they do this just a little bit west of Mexico City. Those that are west of the Rockies, well, their migratory areas where they overwinter, they're more towards the coastline of California and a few other pocket places. Their activity begins when the temperatures start increasing and the daylight hours are changing. So in the spring, this generation that's waking up, well, they come out of diapause now due to these environmental cues. This allows them to finally reach sexual maturity in their development. As they start to fly north, they are mating and also laying eggs, which will be that calendar year's first generation. As these first generation eggs hatch, become caterpillars, and begin the process towards adulthood, well, spring is transferring over into summer. Once the first generation is adult and starts to fly off, well, they continue to spread out throughout North America, repopulating by laying more eggs, the second generation. As the monarch population then increases, going through second generation, and then eventually third generation, we're now in full-blown summer. The monarch we saw flying around here, probably third generation, though it is possible it could be second generation. There is a little bit of overlap, and I did make an episode that talks to you a little bit more about those details if you want to know them. By the time we get to late summer, though, well, that's when we're dealing with the fourth generation and the monarch numbers have peaked. They're as high as they're going to get that year. By late summer and early fall, with the fourth generation reaching adulthood, well, they receive environmental cues that cause it to not be able to reach sexual maturity. They go into what's called diapause. This generation, unlike the previous first, second, and third generation that only lives about six to eight weeks, this Methuselah generation will live nine months approximately. They are the ones that because of environmental cues going into diapause, they begin the migration. For the monarchs that are east of the Rockies, well, they have the impulse to head down towards Mexico City, just a bit west in the fir trees where they will overwinter. Meanwhile, the monarchs that are west of the Rockies, well, they go off into their own migratory journeys into some different coastline areas, as mentioned, and a couple of other pocket regions. Over the winter, the monarch butterfly is mostly inactive. They roost together to conserve energy, to conserve some warmth in the trees, and they're essentially living off of their fat deposits that they were able to store up and develop from nectar along their migratory journey. They stay there throughout the winter until the environmental cues in the spring get them out of diapause, continue their physiology development, and the circle of life continues. How was that? Feel the speed? Now to those who know a bit more, I'm obviously leaving out a whole lot of details, but that's because this migration, these migrations, are some very complex situations with many different details that can influence and affect them. And as we've learned more about the migrations, what we've really also learned is how there's a lot more that we don't know than what we actually do know. I don't know about you, there can certainly be frustration in not knowing something that you really want to know about. But also, I think that this is always exciting in science. When you reach a frontier of knowledge where we can find out, hey, there's things here that nobody knows, and we might be the first ones to figure it out. But let's now delve into what are some of these things that we've identified as we don't know, and they're pretty darn interesting. First, navigation. When it comes to how the fourth generation monarchs are able to navigate and find their way to the overwintering roosting site, the same place that four generations ago, their great, great, grandparents came from is still quite a mystery. 
how do they find that path? How do they find that way and find that location having never been there before? There's no monarchs that they go with that have been there before. There's no one to lead the way and teach them, hey, this is the route. So how do they do it? Is this something that they just automatically genetically know? Or are there environmental cues that signal to them exactly what paths to, to go along? We do know that the monarchs use the sun as a bit of a, a navigation compass each day. And we also have some pretty strong evidence that they're able to sense and detect the magnetic field of the Earth because of studies that they've done to see which way the monarch butterfly orientates during migration season. And when a magnetic field was influenced nearby that experimental setup, well, this confused the monarchs to not orient south. Changing the magnetic field around them tricked them. But we still haven't narrowed it down to what about the physiology of the monarch butterfly, what about its anatomy, is allowing it to actually detect the magnetic field. It's still a mystery. Next up, just exactly how different are the eastern and the western monarch butterflies from each other? as far as the migrations go. The different populations, they know different routes to take. So how much of that migratory impulse and, and how to find your way is genetic and is maybe a genetic difference between the two populations? Are they genetically diverging? And that's where that information is being carried. Because the fourth generation has never been to that overwintering site and yet is still able to find it, that strongly suggests that there is genetics involved with this. The thing is, we have not been able to isolate the migratory gene that allows for this information. We have not been able to find it yet. Maybe it's there, maybe not. It's still a mystery. Next, the environmental cues that trigger and cause the migration to start. What exactly are they? I know this is one that we want to know a lot about because if we're outdoor rearing, we want to make sure we're giving them as much of the outdoor environmental cues as possible. But the truth is, we don't fully know, is it one or two cues? Is it a whole collection of environmental cues? And without knowing what these cues are and which ones are really important and which ones maybe aren't or not important at all, as climate change continues to, well, change things around us, we don't exactly know how that's going to affect the migration. For example, one possibility is that the sunlight hours changing is a very important cue. And that's not going to change as climate change proceeds. So while the day-night cycle is going to continue to be the same, temperatures are going up. We don't really know if in the spring the diapause ends because the nighttime, daytime hours are gradually becoming more day and less night, or if it's because the days are proceeding to get warmer. And so as things start to get warmer because of climate change, really as things continue to get warmer because of climate change, is it important that these two environmental cues happen at the same time? Could one happening earlier in the year, an increase in temperature, cause a disruption as to when the migration starts? If they start waking up early and they start heading north, but the nectaring flowers aren't there and ready for them, that could cause certainly a major problem to the migration. And this isn't just the case of the migration starting in the spring, this is also true of the migration starting in the fall. We've already seen some evidence of monarch butterflies remaining longer than usual in certain areas because of the warmer temperatures. And it's because of these nectar producing flowers being there, they haven't really gotten that signal to start heading down south. Already we're seeing some disruption to the migration. Yet another mystery. Why do some monarchs get really, really lost? Some monarchs have been seen to actually be doing the opposite of migration. During the migration journey, when all are going in one direction, some are actually flying the opposite direction, going north. Is this just like a genetic abnormality? Possibly, we don't know. And then there's some that get really lost. Some monarchs have made it all the way across the Atlantic over to Europe. If the migratory routes are genetic, how does a mistake like that happen? especially knowing no monarchs would ever have any kind of genetic information about such a migratory route to Europe. And so this is something to kind of put on the scale to where this weighs in that maybe migratory routes aren't as genetic as we might think. It might instead be that genetics plays much less of a role and instead environmental cues and possibly even wind currents help the monarch find the migratory route and path to where they need to go. And thus if the environment changes, well that's gonna cause some of these environmental cues to misguide some of these monarchs. Definitely worth studying, definitely worth exploring more. Next up, speaking of those genetics, could Eastern monarchs make the same migratory path as Western monarchs and vice versa? This definitely depends upon how much of that migratory route is genetic information. What I'm saying is, could you take some Eastern monarchs and if they are starting from egg in the Western areas, would they be able to successfully make the migratory routes, even without that genetic information from the Western populations? Could you do the same with the Westerns? Could you take some from California, place them over in Atlanta, Georgia, and see if they make the migratory route to Mexico? These are things that we just don't know yet. 
And one more to bring up for this episode, what about the chemistry that's involved? Dealing with human chemistry of pesticides and herbicides. How are those chemicals affecting the migrations? Now obviously if a pesticide kills a monarch, uh, it affected the migration in the sense that that monarch's not going to migrate, it's dead. But we're saying, what about pesticides and herbicide levels that are maybe non-lethal that the monarchs get exposed to? Neonicotinoids and other chemicals that are involved in herbicides have already been found to be able to affect the monarch butterflies. When we use herbicides, even trace amounts of these chemicals are being found in the milkweed. So even if they don't kill the milkweed plant, the plant still has some of this chemical in it. And we found that these neonicotinoids, well, they're able to impair navigation already. They can impair navigation, they can impair reproduction, and they can impair locomotion, just moving around. Studies have shown that trace amounts of nicotinoids on milkweed have caused monarch caterpillars to actually move sluggish, about two-thirds the speed that they normally do. And since the monarch relies heavily on chemical cues for much of what it does, for detecting pheromones of mates, for being able to detect where flowers are, where food and nectar are, and to, of course, be able to hone in on where milkweed is to lay the eggs. How trace amounts of these chemicals that we're kind of putting everywhere, how they are influencing, affecting, and stressing the monarch butterfly population, we are far away from knowing the full effects. And from the few that we have studied, we're already finding it does influence them, it does affect them, it does stress them. Imagine how many other chemicals that we haven't studied yet are doing the same or similar things. Now, these are just some of the larger mysteries we're trying to solve. The list goes on and on. And as said, this stuff I think is really exciting because it's a whole lot of stuff for us to learn. But now let's think about this. We have a migration that there's a whole lot we don't understand. We do know though that we are influencing it plenty. Imagine you don't know anything about cars and yet your car's making some sort of noise and it's not working properly. You pop open the hood and again, if you know a lot about cars, pretend with me, you know nothing about what you're seeing. If you don't understand how that combustion engine works, do you think the right idea is to just start tooling around with it, changing a bunch of things? If you wanna to try to solve a problem, you've gotta really try to understand that problem very thoroughly first, or you might make a mistake in trying to help things. If we don't know how something works, it's very difficult to attempt to fix it when it's not working. And from what we do know, from what the entire Raising Monarch series has been showing us is that, well, the fragile monarch migration, it's in jeopardy from all of these stressors. The monarch migrations, they are delicately balanced on a web of complexity, a webbing of unresolved mysteries that it rests upon. So when presented with all of this information, it can be natural to feel, Rich, what can I do to help? And you're in the same spot as me. I'm staying the course, what I can do to restore habitat in my yard, planting milkweed, planting nectar producing flowers, especially ones that bloom during the fall for fall migration nectar is so vital to help them out. And I would say the best thing that we can do is to keep learning. Thank you very much for taking some time with me to examine a little bit closer this very delicate, very fragile, and very awesome and beautiful migration. The 3,000 mile trip that the monarchs make, it's a beauty. It's, it's something that really unites all of North America together. And it's definitely worth protecting. I'm Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out the monarchs. And I thank you so much for your interest in their conservation and what efforts you can do to help them. Until next time, take care and I hope your season's going well. I will see you later.